cyber threats, hacking, drone warfare. It seems that the nature of security threats has changed in our interconnected, technology-driven world. Does that make it more dangerous? Does it put us at greater risk of a global conflict, the likes of which we haven't seen in decades? Peter W. Singer is a strategist and senior fellow at New America. He specializes in 21st century security issues and is the co-author of Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war. And he joins us now via Skype from Washington, D.C. for 10 questions on the frightening possibility of just such a war. Let's start with question one. What are the sparks that could potentially ignite World War III in your view? I think it would, the greatest risk is some kind of crisis spinning out of control, a la how World War I started. If you go back to World War I, none of the great powers uh, thought that they would end up in a war, and yet over the course of days and weeks, suddenly it made sense to them. And you could see the same thing playing out in some kind of miscalculation in the South China Sea or Baltics or whatnot. It's the crisis that spins out of control that worries me most. Question two. The past few decades have, of course, been featured by asymmetrical warfare between great powers and non-state actors. Do you think the future will instead feature great powers against great powers? Yes. Uh, the risk from non-state actors isn't going away. It isn't like ISIS or al-Qaeda are disappearing. But what we are seeing is a return to the past, where the worry is not these network groups operating in failed states, but it's actually now a return to a threat from powerful states. Uh, so it's a throwback to Cold War, World War II style, where you're concerned about the Russian military. You're concerned about the Chinese military. But the riff on it is that maybe it's playing out in domains where they they weren't jousting before. So, for example, uh, cyber conflict wasn't a feature of the Cold War, but it's something that we're looking at now. Question three. You have talked about how Chinese military officers, many of them anyway, say they are suffering from a, quote, peace disease. What is that peace disease you refer to? What these Chinese military officers were writing about is they were lamenting the fact that they'd never served in a war before. They'd never served in combat before. They described this as something that they felt bad about. And of course, you know, that's not something you should feel bad about. It's actually a positive. Uh, so this peace disease, it points to kind of, it's a, it's a way of encapsulating a larger issue of nationalism that's been playing out within China and as a more sort of outward, uh, more aggressive posture and an attitude among its military that's certainly concerning. Question four, in what domains would a third world war be fought? I think it's interesting. If we look at the battles that we've been fighting over the last couple decades, they've been only in the ground domain. Our forces, whether it's in Afghanistan or if you go back to a Vietnam, they've been supported by um, air forces and naval forces, but they never had to truly battle for control of the sea, for control of the air. If you were to see a clash between a NATO and a Russia or a clash in the Pacific with a China, you'd see battles on land, air, and sea in the way that you haven't seen for 70 years. But you'd also see potential battles in places where no one's ever fought before. True cyber war, true battles in space for control of space. So it's this multi-domain nature that would make a different uh, World War III than what we've seen in the past. Hmm. Question five, what is a potential new weapon that you might see introduced in a third world war? Gosh, there's a number of them. Uh, it's everything from directed energy, the idea of lasers, which were once something in science fiction, they're now real, to cyber weapons. Uh, we've seen them used in sabotage operations like uh, Stuxnet and how it was used to sabotage Iranian nuclear research. It was just software programming. It would be deployed, or uh, its like would be deployed into conflict, to autonomous robotics. Again, another thing that was in science fiction. Now we have over 80 different nations are working on military robotics today. And, of course, they would be deployed in conflicts with each other. So, really, it's much like how we saw in World War I. There was all of these science fiction technologies back then, the submarine, the airplane, the tank, that became real. The same phenomena would play out if we saw a major conflict moving forward. Question six. World War I lasted four years. World War II lasted six years. What would your speculation lead you to believe the length of World War III could be? 
it would be pure speculation. I think what worries me is the attitudes that you saw before World War I, where the military officers and the government leaders thought it would be a quick and easy war, and instead, as you laid out it, it stretched out. Same phenomenon if you look at attitudes among military officers, whether it's in China or it's in Russia or it's in NATO. When they think about the fighting, the adjectives that they use are short and sharp. It would be quick, it would be easy, and their side, of course, would be the one that would win. And that's not always the way. So I think you know the point is um, it would be speculation, but the lessons of the past point to the one thing we know is both sides can't be right in thinking that it would be quick and easy for their side. Hmm. Question seven. One of the metrics in the past for determining whether you won a war was whether you killed more people on the other side than losses sustained by yourself. Uh, in the future, how do you think warring nations would measure success? I think they measure it as uh, the same way they always have, where it's not just in these losses, as you note, but it's at the end of the day, a war ends when um, the losing side decides that it's been lo it's lost, uh, when it gives up, when it surrenders. If it doesn't, it drags on in some way, shape, or form. So you can be beaten formally on the battlefield, but you can still turn to insurgency or the like, as we saw in the Iraq war, as we're seeing now in Afghanistan. Um, I think the interesting thing, if we're looking at these great power conflicts, is that uh, we've grown accustomed to them as having some kind of formal uh, signature end at it. But if you look you know, further back beyond World War I or World War II, sometimes um, both sides would be exhausted. Sometimes um, uh, each side would decide they just had enough. My point is that wars both begin in a number of different ways through accidents, crises, deliberate choices. They also end in a number of different ways through actual peace agreements, or they drag out, or the two sides just get tired. Question eight, the prevailing view during the Cold War was that it would never escalate to World War III because of MAD, mutually assured destruction. How relevant do you think that doctrine is today? We have to look back at uh, the Cold War and count ourselves really lucky. There was a number of times where we came incredibly close to conflict. The Cuban Missile Crisis is an example. Uh, sometimes we were incredibly close and we didn't even know it. There were these exercises in the 1980s where um, there was almost a nuclear war by miscalculation. So the fact that we have nuclear weapons isn't what keeps us from, it isn't a pure guarantee, it isn't a firewall. You add in now everything from the potential miscalculation, cyber conflict, to um, inexperienced leaders, uh, chaotic leaders, and um, it's worry. Another part of um, MAD is the idea that it's mutual and it's assured destruction. And the injection of cyber conflict um, changes that. There's not mutuality. Both sides uh, are not equally vulnerable to a cyber conflict. Cyber attacks are also hard to figure out if they're hitting you the way you can, for example, clearly know the missile coming at you and who sent it. Cyber attack's not the same. So it's a much more complex space that we're in, a much more worrisome space. Question nine, some have observed that because our economies are so interconnected these days, we wouldn't go to war against each other because there's just no mileage in it. Has the idea of a global village lulled us into a false sense of security in your view? I think it has, and it's a false sense that ignores history. Before World War I, uh, Germany's closest trading partner was France. Uh, and the international economy was almost as globalized as it is now. Before World War II, the U.S. was Japan's greatest trading partner. So the point is, is that um, these ties that bind us, uh, sometimes in history, it hasn't worked out that way. Uh, something that worries me, you know, living in the U.S. right now, is we see a return to the rhetoric of the 1920s and 30s, where uh, the rise of nationalism, the um, putting down of free trade, uh, and you know, the pushing of trade wars. And so you can have economies that are meshed, and sometimes that can lead you to peace, and other times that can lead you to greater anger. And so the point again is not that uh, some um, war is guaranteed, just like peace wasn't guaranteed. But if we're looking at the global system right now, it's at a level of threat and chaos that we certainly haven't seen uh, for several decades. And Peter, let's wrap up with question 10, which given that you're in Washington, D.C., I have to ask this. Given that it's now President Donald J. Trump, does that make World War III more or less likely in your view? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty that uh, Trump has injected into the system and in everything from global politics to the global economy 
to democracy, uh, respectful rule of law, you know, I could go on and on. And I think the injection of that uncertainty and the very clear way that um, he has pushed back against the 70-year uh, system that has kept the world safe, when you look at the NATO alliance and the like, um, that uncertainty is something that leaves a lot of people feeling queasy. Uh, so, you know, again, it's bumpy times uh, ahead. Hopefully it's not something that becomes, uh, escalates into something more dangerous, but um, chaos is not something that you want in a global system. And you've got a front seat for it all. Peter W. Singer, author, Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war. He's a fellow with New America. We're so glad you could join us on TVO again, Peter. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.